All right, class, first off, as always, good day. I'm glad you're here. So today, we are going to be talking about monks, knights, and the Crusades. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with this lesson. All right, so again, the objective, we're going to analyze how the Christian church grew more powerful uh, during the Dark Ages. We're going to examine the equipment used by knights during the Dark Ages, and we're creating an argument on whether this guy named Saladin, which you're going to find out about later, if he, he would have truly fought to the last man like he said he would have. So we're going to look at that. So here is your warm-up picture. The question is basically asking you to analyze this picture and tell me what's going on here. Okay, so look at both people, you know, the lady, the little kid, and the old man, and the um, younger guy. Look at their body language, look at what they're wearing, things like that. Look at the mannerisms. The Again, like I said, body language really plays a big role. So what do you think is going on here? Okay, what do you think is happening here? Okay, so write your response, okay? Don't forget the explanation, okay? Because... All right, because that's worth a lot of points. All right, so go ahead, do that. We're, but we're moving on in three, two, one. All right, so when Rome fell, the Christian church continued, okay, into the Dark Ages. Now, a small town, a bunch of small towns, basically were called a parish, okay? Now, a group of parish, the leader would be a bishop, okay? And the top bishop in Rome, the top priest, was called the Pope, okay? So that still continues to this day. The, the Pope is the person in the Catholic Church who basically is the top priest, if you want to look at it like that. And they basically interpret the... A word of God differently. The ones now definitely different from the ones 200, 200 years ago and they were different from 200 years before them. Okay, so it just changes. All right. Now, monks. These people were dedicated to God. Now, in the 6th century, there was a guy named Saint Benedict and basically he saw it as like, hey, the purpose of life isn't all about you it's about service to others taking care of people you know that's the way to godliness sacrifice and thinking of others before yourself so a lot of these guys they were social workers they worked in schools you know as teachers and things like that they worked in hospitals helped the sick and the uh, the injured and they also were hospital like a hospitality to travelers so they'd be going around mountains and pathways where a lot of people were you know hey they're trying to get to another town they need help they need food they need water um these guys would help them out and they wouldn't expect anything you know it's not like oh i helped you all you got to pay me or you got to give me this or you got to give me that what you have on you no it wasn't about that it was about doing godly work you know, helping out people who need help, things like that. So to a lot of people, these were the heroes of Christianity, the selfless people who gave because they cared and because of their love for God and um, trying to be best people they can be. So. Those guys were the lovers. These guys, those guys love people and things like that. Now we're going to talk about the fighters, warriors, knights. These guys swore an oath of loyalty to their leader and fought for them. Now, these guys would fight. Drop of a dime. No ands, if, or buts about it. Tell me where to go. I'll do it. Now, they were, were rewarded with land. These chunks of land were called vassals and basically whatever they wanted their needs were taken care of 
So let's say a knight was like, you know what? I want to live somewhere. I want pieces of land where I'm away from everybody. I don't want nobody bothering me. Well, no problem. We'll get a chunk of land for you that's way out away from everyone. If the one guy's like, well, you know what? I want to uh, live in a place near water where I can go swimming or fishing. No problem. We got you. You know, so the warrior's needs were met. Now, in order to be a knight, they had to have an ability with the horse, meaning they had to be able to ride it well, maneuver with it, you know, tell if the horse is spooked and things like that. Now, at the beginning of the knighthood, only noble people could become knights. Noble people, again, were those people who, you know, their family had influence, they're an old family, things like that. Um, but as time went on, that started to go down because some of the noble people were like, well, that's beneath me. You know, I should be up here higher. And, you know, I shouldn't be fighting. So it kind of, as time went on, it kind of dimmed down the requirements. Now, by the end of the Dark Ages, there's a thing called chivalry. Chivalry is things that men do to show their gentlemanness especially towards ladies. So a great example is, let's say there's a road right here, right? And you're on the sidewalk with your girlfriend. The chivalry thing for you to do is to, you're supposed to walk near where traffic is, you know, to protect her. Like if you're crossing a road, right? And there's cars coming this way, you are right here in front of the cars and your girl is on the other side. You're protecting her. You know, opening the door for her. Um, it's a little extreme, but this is something that guys kind of did. Like, if there was a puddle of water, guys would take off their jackets and put it down so the girl can step oh, you know, on the water without getting her feet wet. A little extreme, but still, that's something that was seen as chivalry. You know, it was a special code that these guys carried. You know, the knights were supposed to be like that. And again, they were known as the Christian warriors. You know, being gentlemen and things like that. Now, as time went on, the use of armor, it really went away. Particularly because of technology and specifically one weapon. And that was guns. Okay. Guns basically made uh, the knight armor obsolete. So some guys, they would have these chest plates like really close and tight. And if a bullet hit and went through their armor, when they tried to take out the armor, sometimes the metal would be like this against the chest. And now also when a bullet went through, it would kind of cave in and like kind of make hooks into their chest when they took it out it would just like tear that skin off yeah it was pretty pretty painful okay so yeah guns made the armor obsolete now how much did all that weigh typically all of it the helmet the shoulder guard arm guard chest you know piece all that stuff um it was like 90 pounds pretty heavy 40 to 70 percent uh, pounds of that was from the chain mail and like the shin guards and all that stuff. So, yeah. Okay. Swords were about two and a half to four and a half pounds. Some were a little bit heavier. Like William Wallace, supposedly his sword was six feet tall. So his sword had to have weighed like six to eight pounds. You know, so it was a heavy thing. And of course, it wasn't just like with one hand swinging around. No, no. He had to have two hands for that big sword. Now, the Crusades went from 1100 to 1300 um, AD. Now, there were like, I want to say like 17, 16 um, total Crusade battles, but really there was only eight major ones. And this is a fight between the Muslims and the Christians. Particularly what happened was the Turks were attacking the Byzantine Empire. 
and the Byzantine, remember, they are very Christian, Catholic, they asked Pope Urban II to help them out. Because they're like, hey, these Turks, these Muslim people are attacking us, they're attacking us, we need help. So what happened was, Urban's like, oh man, what do I do, what do I do, how do I get the help to them? And he basically looked at what countries are Christian slash Catholic. And Britain and France were great examples. They were uh, Christian and Catholic. And the thing is, they were fighting each other. So Pope Urban goes, guys, 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 why are you fighting each other? Good Christian men, you know, good Catholic men fighting each other. No, stop. You need to fight the real enemy. And that's the Muslims, the Turks. You know, they're invading the Holy Land. You need to go over there and defend it. Now, thing is, he basically told them, you're not going to war. You're going on a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage is a like a holy journey. You know, so like, no, 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 you're not going to war. You're going on a pilgrimage. You're going to go see the Holy Land and pay your respect. Things like that. Now, there was this guy named Peter the Hermit. This guy was a preacher, but he was an amazing recruiter. Basically, he would tell people stuff like, Look, it, I know you've done wrong in your life. We all have. Now, you can ask God for forgiveness, and God will give you forgiveness. But to show the, truly show your love for God and for your love for your religion, you should really go out there and fight to keep the Holy Land safe from the invaders' hands, you know, because who knows what they're doing to the sacred land of where Jesus did this and that and la la la, you know. So many people go, yeah, you know what, I should. So he recruited a lot of people. Now, the first crusades, as you can see from this map, some people took certain routes, some went by sea, things like that. Thing is, there was a lot of chefs in the kitchen and not enough cooks. Meaning there was a lot of people trying to bark orders, do this, do that, do this. So a lot of these nobles thought they were in charge, but nobody really know, knew who was in charge. So all these guys are barking orders and nobody's following the orders. Okay. Strangely enough, the campaigns were kind of successful. It's really by miracles that the, uh, the French and British um, soldiers were winning. And eventually they would win the First Crusade. One of the major reasons why they won was because the Muslims were not united. Because under the Muslim uh, faith, they kind of split her off into two groups. The Shiites and the Sunnis. And these guys typically do not get along. They both view um, their religion differently from one another. Um, you know, like who was the next person... Um, irresponsible, you know, responsible after uh, Muhammad. And so one group said this group, another one said this person was in charge, and that's where they go off and splinter off. So they really didn't help each other. But in the second Crusades, they did work better together, and they ended up kicking the crap out of the Christians. So Crusade number one, Christians won. Crusade number two, the Muslim one. Now, in the third crusade, the Muslim had this one guy in charge. His name was Saladin, and that's supposed to be a picture representing him. Um, for the Christians, they basically had three leaders. One, they had the German emperor, Frederick Barbosa. The French had their king, Philip II. And the, and the uh, English had their king, Richard I, also known as Richard the Lionheart. Now, if you've ever heard the story of Robin Hood and some of that, this is the time of, right here, the Third Crusade, when King Richard's out there fighting and things like that. Robin Hood's fighting alongside of him and stuff like that. Okay, So that's what timeline we're talking about right here, the Robin Hood era. Now... Saladin, when it comes to fighting in the desert, he is a mastermind. 
he knows how to survive in the desert. He knows how to fight in the desert. He knows how to use the terrain, how to find water, things like that. How to basically stretch the usage of without water for so long before, you know, getting some and needing some. Okay. Now, Saladin has a plan. Attack Damascus, then Jerusalem. Well, that's what happened. That's exactly what he did. And he conquered both areas. When he conquered Jerusalem, this like made a lot of the Christian people like, whoa, where did this come from? And things like that. So there was a lot of pressure on them by the church to get Jerusalem back. Now, Emperor Barbosa is returning home. And this is one of the weirdest ways for somebody to die, but it's true. So his horses are going through this path and around them is marshland, basically like a swamp. Now, if you've never been in swamp, swampy water, um, basically like when you put your feet in the ground, your feet start to sink until it hits solid ground. Okay, otherwise you're just going to, it's like keeps, the weight keeps putting pressure and it keeps going down further and further. Well, what happened was Frederick Barbosa, his horse got spooked and he fell in the marsh water. The water is only about maybe close to three feet deep, maybe, All right? It's not that deep, maybe two feet, two and a half feet, you know? So what happens is... He falls in the water. Remember I told you how much the armor weighed. So he's trying to pick himself up. But when he's picking himself up, his hands are going into that very, very soft dirt. You know, that mud water. And his hand gets, starts sinking deeper and deeper. He's trying to pick himself up. So imagine trying to put your hand on the ground and your hand starts sinking through. And that's exactly what happens to him. So as men get down, they're trying to get him up. But their feet are starting to sink too. So they're trying to pick them up, but they're sinking. And what ends up happening is Barbosa drowns in the swamp water. Yeah. In only water like this deep. You know, it's it's not that deep at all. But again, because that ground is very soft and it just his hands and knees and stuff like that just keep sinking, he drowns. Now, Richard is told, you need to take Egypt. You need to take Egypt. And he's like, well, why would I go to Egypt? I am fighting in the Holy Land. I'm trying to get this holy territory. Egypt has nothing to do with Jesus, you know? Jerusalem does. Damascus, you know, has you know holy ties, not Egypt. So he's kind of like uh, iffy about the whole orders to go to Egypt. Now, at the Battle of Jerusalem, the Christians attack, thinking, "Oh, we can defeat Saladin." Doesn't work. And at the Battle of Jaffa, Saladin wins. And then the Christians come again, and then he loses. Then he attacks, and he basically tells them, Hey, I'm willing to fight to the last man. You know. So basically him and the Christians have a talk, and they come to agreement, and he backs down. So he almost won it, and he was prepared to fight to the end. So, yeah. Yeah, he, he said he was willing to sacrifice all his men to take claim this territory and stuff like that. Now, I know this isn't on your notes, but it's a little story because it does relate to the Crusades. Okay, so if you guys ever heard the story of the Pied Piper, or if you watched the movie Shrek, um, Shrek Ever After, where the... Ogres are all dancing from this guy because he's playing the little flute. This is, that's a Pied Piper. And this is a story of how he came to be. So in 1212, France and Germany, they're basically told, we need more soldiers. We need more fighters. 
and they basically set off all their husbands and older sons and things like that. So what ends up happening is they're like, well, why don't we send the children to go fight? Yeah, yeah, let's have the children go. So these people let their kids, 8, 10, 12 years old, march and go to the Holy Land. Yeah. Now, here's the sad thing. As some of these kids are marching, they're being kidnapped, sold into slavery and things like that. Um, some are killed. Some just get lost and never heard from again. Um, some actually make it to the ocean and their boats sink, you know, because of rough tides and things like that. And some actually make it to the Holy Land, and then we don't know what happens to them. So now people are like, oh my God, how could we send our kids and things like that? And they needed a scapegoat. They needed something to explain why all these kids are gone from their neighborhood and their communities and in their country. So the story of the Pied Piper came to be. Basically, this man came with the flute and lured the kids away. Later on, the story would change. That the guy played the flute and the, he was able to get all the mice out of town. But again, these parents didn't want to blame themselves. Being like, oh yeah, I sent my eight-year-old into another country to fight in a war. They didn't want to sound stupid. They didn't want to sound like they did something irresponsible so they made up a story and they used the pipe piper as a scapegoat blame the pipe piper that's why the kids are gone blame him there was no pipe piper it's a legend okay so that's the origin of the pipe piper all right so i know i have two questions in here and you only have one question to answer so just answer the top one would you consider the Crusades really a war? Or do you think the Pope was right? It's a pilgrimage. These guys were going to go see the Holy Land. And if they just don't happen to fight, they happen to fight. So what do you think? Was it a war? Or was it a pilgrimage that just so happened to involve fighting? And explain why you think that. Okay? So... Once you're finished with this question, you're done with this lesson. Hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, guys, you take care. You be safe. And I'll see you guys later, okay?